What a beautiful day the Lord has given us this day, and what a privilege it is to gather in an assembly like this with many brethren and friends who come to serve and worship the Lord God Almighty. We're glad you're here. We are graced with the presence of several who are visiting. I, uh, I know that several, uh, maybe from out of town at least, are uh, planning to travel later to the Tampa area, Temple Terrace uh, as a suburb to be specific, where Florida College is located, where beginning tomorrow evening and through Thursday evening, the college uh, presents a series of lectures, Bible lectures, and so many brethren have come for that purpose. I noticed uh, coming in from the Bible class period that I noticed there were several gospel preachers in the audience this morning. And I thought, well, uh, I guess if I'd known in advance, we could have asked uh, one of them to preach at this hour. But since we didn't know that they were coming, the other alternative, I guess we could have all of them speak one at a time. Now, we might go into the afternoon if we did that. But maybe if you'll think through that possibility, you won't complain about how long I preach. <laughs> all right. We're thankful for your coming. I hope you brought a Bible with you that you'll be opening with me to the reading found in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, our text to begin our lesson, the writer says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive just a just reward... How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. If you were with us last Lord's Day, you may recall that I introduced the study in the book of Hebrews, pointing out that it is it begins in an unusual fashion, at least when compared to many of the letters of the New Testament. Whereas many of the letters begin with who the writer is and to whom it is written. Hebrews starts, you might say, in the middle of its, of its theme and point. Where in chapter 1 and verse 1, it just starts off with God. God, who at various times and in, and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. And the importance as you read through the letter of Hebrews is that it's writing to a people who are urged to pay attention to the Son of God, his spokesman to us. You don't have to read very long in the letter of Hebrews that you know why it is named Hebrews. It is written to people who in the flesh were Jews, who were Hebrews. And in fact, probably people for the most part who lived in and around Jerusalem, where the temple was located. Written probably about some 30 years after the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe many of them, even of that number, who on the day of Pentecost heard the word and were baptized, and had remained, many of them, in that area. What has happened over that period of 30 years is that much persecution has occurred. In fact, maybe even loss of jobs, separation from families, certainly not able to do maybe many of the social things that they had been doing earlier before they committed their faith in the Lord Christ. In fact, we do know that in time, even many of the Gentile churches in Macedonia, Achaia, and Galatia raised support to send to the poor saints that were in Jerusalem. Why were they poor? Maybe even alluding to the fact that they had been persecuted. But also, perhaps in their mind at this point in their lifetime was wondering why Jesus had not already returned. Maybe when they first obeyed the gospel, they thought it would be soon thereafter. But it, and now at least even at that point, maybe some 30 years or so had passed and he had not returned. And in fact, they had suffered at the hands of persecution. And besides, they seemed strange in Jerusalem. They were unlike the majority of the people. There was that temptation that temptation to go back to what maybe their forefathers, their parents had done, be a Jew. The law of Moses, you see, had been given by God. Hadn't it been God's will? And so what's so bad, what's so wrong about maybe returning back to Moses? And therefore, this letter right early begins to point out the superiority of God's Son 
God's spokesman. In fact, you, you get into chapter 4, and, and even he speaks about how Moses was great, but Moses was simply a servant in the house of God. But Jesus Christ was a son over the house. In chapter 5 through 7, he talks about the priesthood of Jesus Christ after the order of Melchizedek. And while indeed the Levitical priesthood was God's will, had served God's people for over many years, 1,500 to be exact, at least from the time of Moses, yet Jesus Christ, being of the priesthood of Melchizedek, was in a greater priesthood. Just as he was greater than Moses, so now the priesthood is greater than that which they had known. For you see, Abraham had paid tithes to Melchizedek, and therefore even the Levitical priests through the loins of Abraham had paid tithes to the greater. And so Melchizedek and his priesthood is the greater. You get into chapter 8, particularly he talks about the covenant, that Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, established upon better promises. And so over and over you see the warnings or the thrust of the book, don't turn away from Christ. He is superior. He's God's spokesman to us. As we study, though, in our text that I've just read, you notice that he raises a very sobering question. How shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Indeed, that is quite a question to raise. And in fact, to these who have heard about the Christ and have known the Christ and maybe who are tempted to turn away, there's a thought that they need to consider what will occur if they're not found faithful at the time he returns. You know, we may say the setting, of course, as I've just said, is about Israelites, the Jews, the Hebrew Christians, and yet it has an application even to our own time. While we may not be specifically in the same shoes they were, we're not Jews literally, and we're not in Jerusalem, we're not tempted maybe in the same degree they were to go back to Moses, we are tempted to be like the people around us. We're in a time of peace and prosperity in this country, and it is so easy for us to be casual. And, well, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but we're not on fire sometimes. We're not as zealous as we ought to be. We're not as eager to worship every time the doors are open with God's people. We're not as eager to really manifest a type of enthusiasm for the Lord. And maybe what really fits most of us or many of us is that we are neglectful of the great salvation. You see, neglect is not an intentional matter. It's something that happens when we sort of drift away, and that's, that's really the language here in chapter 2, lest we drift away. Can we drift ourselves? I want you to notice as the Hebrew writer has outlined this book, and we made this point even in our sermon last week from chapter 1, that even this question in chapter 2 is based on who Christ is, that God now speaks to us through him. Who is Jesus? And in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we pointed out these last week. He's the heir of all things through whom God made the world's brightness of God's glory. In fact, the express image of his person, upholding all things by his word, purged our sins and now sitting at the right hand of God on high. When you stop and think about the description of Jesus as described in these first few words or verses of Hebrews, it is sufficient that we should guard our hearts that we not turn away or drift away. As you continue through chapter 1, in fact, he talks about how Christ is superior to angels, even angels who are higher than men. And with these two points that God speaks to us through his Son, that Christ is superior to angels, for which of the angels did he ever say, Thou art my son? Which of the angels did he ever say, Sit thou on my right hand? And, of course, those questions are raised in chapter 1 with the answer not even having to be written. It's obvious. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is none of his angels. Did he ever say, sit on my right hand, or thou art my son? But when we consider who Christ really is, therefore, chapter 2 begins, based upon the fact that he is superior, not only to Moses, to angels, we ought to give the earnest heed, the more earnest heed, in fact. That says there ought to be some diligence. But why does he raise this point? Why is it so obvious, or is it obvious? Is he saying 
Therefore, consider how God felt about the law of Moses. For what his point is, if the word, verse 2, spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So we see, looking at what he's comparing to the salvation, it is, is a law that God gave, and he says it was steadfast, consider it. Yeah, it was given through angels. In fact, other scriptures so declare that. In Galatians chapter 3 and and, and in verse 19, where in that letter the apostle is trying to urge and at least teach how that the law of Moses was given by God. It was given for a purpose to lead us unto Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3, 19, in fact, he says, what purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And then he says it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Yeah, we look to Moses, but as the lawgiver, but the scripture says it was appointed through angels. Even in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen, just shortly before he was stoned to death, the first martyr for the Christ, he was preaching and teaching even to those who were standing there, and he declared how that even as they had persecuted the prophets before him, so he says their hearts now were against God. They rejected the word, a word that was received by the direction of angels. So now the point is that here is the law of Moses that was steadfast. How important is it to God? Well, it's appointed through angels, received by the direction of angels. It was important in God's sight, and yet it was steadfast. What does that mean? The law was steadfast. I tell you, when you look at it, you have to say it mattered to God whether man kept it or not. It mattered to God. There are some today who kind of voice the expression, well, it really doesn't matter what we do just so we're honest and sincere. That's a favorite, a favorite saying in our religious world. And it satisfied the hearts of many people who would say, well, now, you know, you just go join the church of a choice. It doesn't really matter. Or if you want to believe it this way, that's all right, but leave me alone. I want to believe it that way. And, and that kind of attitude has caused many people to close their Bibles and to close their minds. But the same God who gave us the gospel through Jesus Christ is the one who gave the law of Moses through Moses himself. And that law was steadfast. In fact, the scripture says, every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. What does that imply? When you look through even just the letter of Hebrews itself, you find some other warnings about how this law was steadfast. In chapter 10, in verses 26 through 29, there the apostle, the writer says, for if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I do not believe he's talking about single sins that we may commit, but rather to a people who may re be rejecting the Christ and turning back to Moses. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth about who the Christ really is, there's no other way. Moses, by the law, Moses did not bring about salvation, eternal life. And if you turn away from Jesus Christ, there is no more, no other means of a sacrifice for sins. But here, here's what does happen. In Hebrews 10, verse 27, a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much sorer punishment or worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? When you read that verse, it ought to cause us to quake and tremble just a bit. How do we handle the words spoken by Jesus Christ? In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25, there again the writer says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. How important is the gospel of Jesus Christ? When you look at this, the argument has been the law was steadfast. 
Every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, there would be punishment. God's law was definite. God intended that it be kept and that it be obeyed. But now again, looking at the very point that the writer is making in Hebrews chapter 2, he said, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. You notice it's not saying, well, lest we just turn our hearts and say, I don't believe it anymore. He didn't say, lest we just totally reject it like those who had stoned Stephen. He said, lest we drift away. Is that perhaps written to Christians? Christians who can neglect. In fact, he goes on, if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. You see, the law of Moses was God's law, but it served its purpose in a steadfast manner. But the point is, it was not the great salvation. The law of Moses, though given by God, did not make man perfect. It could not forgive sins. As Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, in fact, the Hebrew writer speaks how that there was annulling of it. It was taken away. It was annulled because the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, Hebrews 7, 19 says, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Indeed, that law, with its sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, could not take away sin. In Hebrews chapter 10, in fact, the writer says, the law, having a shadow of good things to come, the, can never, with those same sacrifices which they offered continually, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Once every year, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. But that was repeated year after year after year. But the gospel of Jesus Christ in comparison, is a great salvation. Perhaps we understand that it was great because it's based upon great love. As in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In fact, it is based upon greater sacrifice. It's not the sacrifice of animals, of blood, of bulls and goats, but as in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, the scripture says Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, nor with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having offered eternal redemption. Consider that the Christ, the greater high priest now, has one time for all time, made sacrifice for our sins. Doesn't have to be repeated over and over like the animal sacrifices had to be done. Greater sacrifice, also greater reward. For in Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Indeed, when you consider the two, it's quite easy to see the contrast that the writer is making in the letter of Hebrews. Why turn back to Moses? Why turn back to the law and to those things that really have already served their purpose and been fulfilled? What we have with a great salvation is the word spoken by the Lord. Jesus himself, God's spokesman to us this day and confirmed by those who heard him. The apostles indeed on the day of Pentecost said we are witnesses. We not only have preached what the Word says in prophecy being fulfilled, that He indeed would be crucified, that He would be raised the third day. We are witnesses to these things. 
They bore that. Many of them even put to death. As we know, Stephen was stoned for that testimony. But there were then the apostles themselves. We, we know there was James who was beheaded. It is said that Paul later was beheaded, that Peter was crucified and asked to be crucified upside down. Why would these men suffer the kind of death that they suffered if it were not so? Would they have died for a lie? Indeed, what they testified is that Jesus, the Son of God, who worked miracles and signs, God attesting by them that He is the Son of God, that He was crucified, that on the third day He arose from the grave. Indeed, confirmed by those who heard Him, but also God bore witness by signs and wonders and miracles. These three words really are identifying the same act, you might say, a, a work, a miracle, that no man could do except God be with him. And it was as a sign from God to testify, this is so. God bears witness to that by this sign. But this sign caused amazement, was a wonder in their hearts. And therefore, God bore witness. When you talk about the great salvation, you're talking about the gospel, God's power unto salvation. And so we go back to this question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I want you to pause and think with me at this point. I'm sure in this audience, you're not troubled, maybe like the Jews or the Hebrews to whom this letter was written. But as I said earlier, we are sometimes troubled with a sense or an attitude that causes neglect. But we don't intend to really reject Christ. We, our intention is not to turn away from Him. You wouldn't even be in this assembly. And there may be others who will be hearing this uh, uh, on our website who would say, well, you know, I believe in the Lord. But they're not really serving Him wholeheartedly and faithfully. Lest we drift away was the writing in Hebrews 2 and verse 1. Lest we drift. It's not the same as saying, I refuse to obey Him. It's those who said, well, yes, I have obeyed Him. But they began to drift. When the, the Lord, in introducing Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we have letters to the seven churches of Asia. There's one in particular that catches my attention. It was at Sardis. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, the description was of a church that had a name that it was alive, but actually it was dead. I say brethren even can become dead in faith. When James writes in James chapter 2 verses 14 through 17 raises the question, what did the prophet, my brethren, if a man say he has faith but hath not works, what did the prophet? Can faith save him? He says in verse 17, faith without works is dead being alone. How sad it is to hear somebody say, you know what? Yes, I've been baptized. Well, I don't really worship all the time. I've had a lady tell me that she wanted to be a member of the church, and she really doesn't come because, well, Saturday nights is the night that she stays up rather late. It's the night her husband is off work, and so she stays up late and she just cannot get up early enough to come. Can you say that's a faith that really is neglectful? How can she remember the Lord's death and suffering as we have this morning, partaking of the Lord's Supper? How can she love the brethren, in fact, and be encouragement to one another as we should be in assemblies like this? How can one really say, you know, I'm, I love the Lord with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. But yeah, there are times where I'm just too busy with other projects or things, and it isn't that important to me to always gather with the saints or to worship together. It's a sad fact. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation caused by the precious death of our Savior who crucified on the cross? Indeed, there are those who need to understand, even as the Hebrew writer, as he goes on in chapter 3 of Hebrews, in verses 12 through 14, he says, Beware, brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. I say when you look at that scripture, he's talking to Christians. I know sometimes there are those who hold a doctrine that says once saved, always saved, and they said if you're really ever saved, you, you can't leave it. And yet this says there are some who depart. You can't 
You can't not depart from this auditorium. You haven't been in it. So here he's warning people who have been in fellowship with Christ who may depart from the living God. Then he says in verse 13, Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if, if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Be faithful, brethren. Beware. In fact, look at chapter 6, where in verses 4 through 6, he describes the condition of some Christians who have drifted away to the point that it becomes impossible for them to return. When he says in verse 4, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. There are those whose hearts become hardened. They drift away, and to the point, finally, it becomes impossible to stir their hearts again to bring them back to the Lord. Do you think that could happen to you? Probably not. You probably would say, no, that couldn't be me. But there are those, and I see in this audience even some who are members of the Lord's church even here, and that you know you, you are irregular about your worship, irregular about the activity you're involved in with the Lord's church, if, if this church depended upon you, it would have failed long ago. It's not that you intend to be against Christ, but by neglect of that great salvation, you become one who's drifting away. And it can get to the point where, indeed, you may fall away, and fall away become impossible to renew. What a sad state to face the Lord's judgment in the face, in a sense of saying, Lord, I once knew, I once was faithful, I once was baptized even. And the Lord would say, well, what happened? Well, I just drifted. I just drifted away. But there are also those in this audience who've really never even obeyed the gospel who would say, whoa, I believe. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and, and you know, someday I'm going to become a Christian. Someday I'm going to be baptized. Someday I'm going to come and get involved in the work of the Lord, and, but I'm just busy right now. And, and later I will, but at the moment it, it just isn't, it, well, it isn't convenient. In Galatians chapter 3, the apostle said, we are become the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. But notice it isn't just a faith only, that is the mental agreement, as maybe some would sit here and say, yeah, I agree. I believe he's the Son of God, all right. When he says in verse 27, Galatians 3, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Those who have the kind of faith that I'm willing to obey, I'm willing to stand up and name him as my Lord, and I will make him, I'll be, make a servant to him. Those are the ones who truly are God's servants. But then there's that great many who would say, I intend to someday. You know the old saying, the street that leads to hell is paved with the brick of good intentions. How sad it'll be come that day of judgment. That one would say, I knew, I knew what I needed to do, but I never found exactly the right hour. In James chapter 1, the writer said, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Interesting how this added, deceiving yourselves. For there is that self-deception that says, yes, I believe and someday I'm going to do it. Someday I'm going to change my lifestyle. Someday I'm going to do better. But they put off and put off and really sort of pat themselves on the back because of their good intentions. To him, therefore, that knoweth to do good to him and doeth it not to him, it is sin, James 4, 17. I've raised the question, as you can see, as the text, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And the answer really is quite obvious from the verses we've already read. The fact is we won't escape, will we? Those who neglect the great salvation will not escape. In fact, the writer in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9, really writes the answer very plainly. When he speaks of when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and 
in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That'll be a sad day, won't it? A sad day. Judgment day can be a wonderful and a great day, but it can be a sad day. I hope you'll stop and think, where are you in this picture? What is your role with the Lord? What could it be said of your spiritual condition at this point? Are you one who's never named the Christ, just intending to someday? Or are you one who has named the Lord, but do become neglectful in your worship and your service to Him? Our song of invitation, and it'll be on the chart up here behind me in a moment, but it's will Jesus find us watching. It's in the form of a question. When Jesus comes to reward His servants, whether it be noon or night, Faithful to him will he find us watching with our lamps trimmed and bright. Can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Will he find you and me still watching, waiting when the Lord shall come? There are questions thought-provoking. I hope you'll be honest with you and yourself. If the Lord should come this day, how would he find you? Ready? Watching? Or do you need to make some changes in your life and in your service to Him? If indeed you find in your own heart you're ready to serve Him wholeheartedly but have not been, we want to assist you. We sing this song as an invitation. If we can assist you in turning your life to Christ, now is the hour. If you need to be immersed for remission of sins, we have a baptistry ready. If you're a Christian but have become a neglectful Christian and you know you've done things that really are a hindrance to the cause of Christ rather than a help to his cause. You want us to pray with you and pray for you. We'll do that as well. We ask you to consider where you are with the Lord. You're subject to that invitation anyway. We bid you come even now as we stand together and what we sing.